One day, a man went for a walk to raise some money for the NHS. One little soul like me isn't going to make much difference. 100 lengths of his garden later, and Captain Tom Moore had raised tens of millions of pounds and become a global inspiration. Hi, Tom. Ben Stokes here. What you've managed to achieve is absolutely fantastic. You inspired me. I just wanted to send a huge congratulations. If we as a country can show the same spirit of optimism shown by Captain Tom Moore, we will beat it. How have you been handling the attention? Because the attention has been incredible. I must say, I rather enjoyed it. <laughs> An array of honours culminated with Her Majesty the Queen coming out of lockdown to especially award Captain Tom a knighthood. And now, for the first time, Captain Sir Tom will delve into a century of memories. We'll tell some of the secrets. Not all of them. He'll tell his very personal history of Britain and the moments that made him the man he is today. I was left with no job, no qualifications. Sex and miniskirts all seemed to go together. The person I married had gone. This is the story of a national hero who was 100 years in the making. Well, I'm ready when you are. Tom Moore's hometown is Keithley in West Yorkshire. I was born on the 30th of April, 1920, but I don't think my life starts there. It starts before that. I think you've got to go back to my grandfather, the original Tom Moore, who could never read or write. He must have been up in the dales doing an awful lot of dry stone walling. But Thomas Moore was a Yorkshireman with ambition. He started up a building company in Keithley. He progressed very well, considering that he had very little schooling. He was a very determined man. I mean, don't forget, in the world that Captain Tom was born into, the vast majority of people never went to university and never dreamed of going to university. So if you wanted to progress, you had to do so by your own kind of practical efforts. You know, the 20s and 30s were a great age of building. This was a great age of the suburbs. You're building houses for all these people who've come home from the First World War. So the demand for master builders was great. There's a lot of money to be made. Tom's grandfather learned the engineering techniques necessary to become a master builder. He constructed houses all around Keithley. We have built a lot of houses up here. Including a large home for his own family called Club Nook, which still stands today. But this wasn't the crowning achievement of the man with no formal education. In fact, the war memorial in the centre of the town was built by my grandfather. This was one of the first war memorials in Britain, opened in 1924 to a packed-out crowd. It wasn't the only thing to admire about old Thomas More. I think people liked him. In his own way, he believed in women's rights. Some of the men, if they got the money, they went straight to the pub, and the poor wives had little to manage with. But my grandfather insisted they got some money in their hand. Often women had no economic power at all. They didn't have a bank account. Um, they didn't have their own separate savings. They didn't even exist as an independent financial entity. To be insisting that the women, that the wives get some of that money is, is very enlightened, actually, by the standards of the day. Captain Tom's father, Wilfred, also worked in the family building business. I couldn't have had a, a nicer father than he was, although I, there was a big drawback that he and I 
could never have long conversations together because my father was extremely deaf. It was always very difficult for him. The one thing Tom could enjoy with his deaf father was a trip to the silent movies. And that was the picture house, which was the premier cinema of the town. Remember that well. It's an extraordinary thing that we've lost sight of, actually, just how important cinemas were to people. Picture palaces. Of course, people didn't have TVs. The cinema was a glimpse of another universe, steeped in glamour and stardust and excitement and so on. And cinema attendances in Britain are enormous between the wars. You can't overestimate, actually, the importance of the picture palace in kind of forming the culture of the day. Of course, in black and white, and the other ones, there was no sound. There was maybe somebody playing a piano. And we used to watch things like cowboy ones. At that time, it was a series. Every week, you had to go. I've always liked westerns because the, the good ones always win. Tom's personality isn't just a product of his father's side of the family. That's my mother here on the, on the right. My mother was the headmistress of a little village school. My mother and father have not been unkind, but my mother was the brighter of the two. A very happy childhood. I wasn't brought teddy bears or anything, I was brought things that were practical, that uh, were useful as you grew older. My father would bring me presents of a piece of wood and some nails and a hammer, or a, uh, or a bigger hammer. I'm quite right, too. Tom raised his own daughters, Lucy and Hannah, with whom he now lives, in exactly the same way. For your birthday, you'd get a set of tools. Yeah, I remember. I mean, that's why you have a very good tool set now. I do, yeah. But I remember you making me go under the car to change the oil. Yes. <laughs> Nobody encouraged Tom's practical skills more than his father's brother, perhaps the most influential character of his entire childhood. Yes, sir. Uncle Billy. Billy Moore was part of a group of daredevil Yorkshiremen and women who were the pioneers of extreme sports. Whether it was biplanes or motorcycles, the tougher the challenge, the bigger the thrill. Motorbikes were Britain's most popular form of working-class transport. Between the wars, there were 300 different manufacturers, and Uncle Billy rode Scots, made in Yorkshire. His antics often made the local press. Such was Billy's riding ability that one of his favourite tricks was to ride across the local canal on a plank only six inches wide. He was also seen riding through town while reading a newspaper, seemingly with perfect control of the machine. We do that for uh, effect. Yeah, yeah, true, yeah, true, yeah. The ultimate test was the Scott Trial, a timed event held over Yorkshire's harshest terrain. Okay, I've got something to show you. This is about motorcycles. Grandson Benji shares some original footage of the event. This is a Scott Trial, yes. Young Tom learned that what most called a severe challenge, others considered entertainment. These fellows say they do it for fun. I wouldn't do it for a thousand pounds. Ninety-year-old memories that are still fresh. I remember most of these places. And that was a park where I showed outside at Kettlewell. Competitions like this attracted huge crowds. Uncle Billy excelled. He was very skilled. He was a wizard. 
He won so many times that a Billy Moore Cup is still awarded today to the best-placed Yorkshireman on the Scott trial. Tom's uncle was a local hero. They were very fond of me. I mean, we got on extremely well. My father named his dogs after Billy, and he was an incredibly important person in his life. As a boy, I spent a lot of time with him. It wasn't long before Tom wanted a piece of the action himself. My first motorcycle I found in a barn, and I bought for half a crown. The tires were flat, it was covered in dust, and didn't run. Now, I was 12, and <laughs> not, not boasting, but I'd been brought up with motorbikes. And on my own, without anybody's help, I got it run and ran it in the field. Nobody came and gave me a help. They just assumed they'll do it, and they did it. We all know how it feels when you first drive, and you think, oh, I have freedom, I'm independent. He got that at 12. With his dog, Billy, he was able to roam the moors and be who he wanted to be. If ever my father was talking about his motorcycle years, he, he would light up. He absolutely loved being on a motorcycle. But the happy childhood that had taught Tom about hard work, fairness, practical skill and independence was about to deliver heartbreaking family tragedy. Very, very sad. Mm -hmm. Captain Tom Moore's charity walk took place during three whirlwind weeks in April. Four months later, and the family are still dealing with all the gifts that were sent. So this is George, and that's Dave. Hello. And, and they've been coming every week to take all the recycling away. Well done. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you ever nice so much. You. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. It's quite interesting. <laughs> Things happening around me are different, but inside here, nothing's changed. I'm still the same Tom Moore as I was. That's a Tom Moore who was born and bred in the Yorkshire Dales. Behind each of these century-old photographs of his hometown, Keithley, lies another treasured memory waiting to be unlocked. It brings me back. I think this is a bit interesting because one of the presents that my father gave me was a half plate uh, camera. There's a doorway there with steps which lead up to up there, and that was held by the Keithley Photographic Association. I was a member of, and used to go up there to develop films. Not that this thoroughly modern man believes everything was better in the good old days. What's the post of town when you got one of those? And this will do all that any of that would do ten times over. The Keithley Photographic Association searched their archives for any photos Tom may have taken. They found none. But they did find an old shoebox full of prints labelled Wilfred Moore, Tom's father, which Tom is now seeing for the very first time. That's my father's signature, all right. It's an unintentional father's gift made in 1920. You, I was born. Delivered to his son 100 years later. Yes, sir. That's my father there. I don't think I've seen him looking as young as that. I'm interested to see my father there. That's, that's my father. Very good, marvelous. Tom's father documented daily life in all its forms. Funny potato. <laughs> Do 
jo Joseph, King Joseph, and, and the Queen. There's one subject in this remarkable time capsule that is inevitable: motorcycles. Because I've still got an accessory in Headland. Tom's mechanically minded family loved motorbikes and the competitions that took place across Yorkshire's unforgiving terrain. A young Tom idolised his uncle Billy, one of the most famous riders. Sadly, in 1935, this colourful character met a tragic end. He was working on his car in the garage and he stayed there too long and the fumes got him. My father and I had to get him out of his car in his garage and carry him in the house. So at 15, I carried a dead Billy into his house. So, I mean, I have that recollection that uh, not the happiest one. Did you miss him when he was gone? Yes, I did, yes. Very much so, yes. Very, very, very sad. Mm. Captain Tom received 170 portraits as thank you gifts from members of the public. It's amazing. That's good because it's got all the medals on there. Yes. The paintings will be catalogued and displayed in an online gallery. You name it, we've had it from sweets, chocolates, pictures. Nearly all of them are perfect. They really are very good indeed. They're recognizable and they. You know, you know who it is. <laughs> yes, I think some of, some of them are very good. I mean, that one goes back. That was when I was just being commissioned as a second lieutenant. I don't look like that now, but I did. I managed to get by with some of the girls, all right. <laughs> War broke out in 1939 and Tom was conscripted into the Duke of Wellington's regiment at the age of 20. But he wasn't the only Moor to go to war. No, I've got a sister, Frida, who was two years older than me. She was a plotter in Lincolnshire, plotting well, the uh, German plane. Tom's sister volunteered to help coordinate the RAF fighters that shot down German aircraft over Britain. Meanwhile, in Tom's hometown, more than £1 million was raised for the war effort, proving record-breaking fundraising is something of a tradition for people from Keithley. But by now, Tom was in a different world. He was posted 7,000 miles away to India and the multinational 14th Army, who fought in the brutal Burma campaign. There, he faced the savage Japanese army, as well as monsoon conditions, stifling heat and virulent tropical disease. It was one of World War II's harshest environments. It was unpleasant. I was at the, in the forefront with the Indian Army. We were under fire constantly. The motorbike skills Tom learned in the Yorkshire Dales served him well when he was entrusted to deliver vital messages. The other way of getting to the front from the tanks was on a motorcycle through several miles of jungle, which fell to me. Tom was riding through a war zone riddled with hidden enemy soldiers. I was only 21 or 22. You don't get very frightened at 22. During a three-year posting, he went on to train other dispatch riders in the regiment, which provided some welcome respite.
being an opportunist, <laughs> when, when I ran this motorcycle course, I had decided that the passing out test, we would go to Bombay and have a night in Bombay and come home again. It so happened that Sylvia lived in Bombay. <laughs> she was a pretty girl. She'd been brought up in India and kept running these courses and I ensured that each course finished at a weekend. I knew the British boys would look after themselves. I looked after Sylvia. Yes. So that, that was quite a little, happy little thing. Sylvia was happy. The Brigadier was happy. I was happy. Yeah, well, it went on very well. I enjoyed the army. Today, the honorary colonel is receiving his freshly restored medals, along with an important addition. Without further ado, thank you. There we go. Let's have a look. Look That's lovely. at yes, that. that really is nice. And um, if you look, there's another layer underneath as yes. well. Look at the miniatures. Yes. Yes. So we've yes. added your knight's bachelor badge. That's your knighthood badge. Oh, That's super. Thank you very much. <laughs> Honours continue to be awarded, a level of recognition that makes the builder's son just a little emotional. Yes, I mean, I, mean, I, think, I mean, grandfather would have, he, he would have been quietly very pleased. I mean, and my father, he would have been delighted. And if he's still up there hearing it, he, he will be absolutely delighted. You know, of all the people in the family who would be, who would be pleased that would be my father. This attention is a far cry from the situation Tom found himself in 75 years ago. After the war, Tom was back in Yorkshire and searching for work. Post-war Britain was a very grey and gloomy place. We had five or six years of austerity. Rationing gets worse after the war than it had been during the war. The country is hugely indebted, and I think there was a real sense of exhaustion. I was left with no job, with no qualifications that anybody wanted. So I got a job as a labourer in a quarry. And although I say it myself, I was the best labourer they'd ever had. Wasn't long before I was using explosives. At a Keithley quarry, they're getting ready for the big blast. That wasn't the job I intended, so I took a job selling books at people's doors. It was woman's own. Women's magazines are a kind of how-to guide for this sort of shiny new consumer society that Britain is building in the post-war years. You have door-to-door -door salesmen because you have a much more affluent society with hugely rising wages and living standards. And you have these housewives who decide what the family budget goes on. And basically, you're going to their house to sort of confront them in their lair and to extract their money from them. That's what you were doing. You had to con them. It was a, a soul-destroying job. They were too kind-hearted. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't really bear to take money off these ladies. Tom headed south to find his fortune and went back to the building trade. And I started selling roofing materials for a company in Gravesend. You know, I was quite good at that. I was intent on going up, 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 up. He joined another building firm and was soon rewarded with more responsibility. I was covering north of England and Northern Ireland. Tom was in his 30s and in a vibrant new era heralded by the Queen's coronation of 1953. Britain, with its 25-year-old monarch, was modernising. Britain in the 50s 
a country that was being transformed by the car. Many more people had cars than ever had them before. And of course, the roads weren't made for cars. You know, they were made for horses and carts and so on. That's when you start to see the wholesale sort of redevelopment of a lot of town centres to make room for cars. But you also see the government realising they've got to do something about motorways. And you have the opening of the M1 in 1959. Yes, I went on that, merely to see what it was like. There was very little traffic on it. You just have to drive flat out on there, I mean, foot down and just keep it there. And which company car did Tom enjoy driving the most? A British icon, the Mini. They were fantastic little cars. You could drive them flat out for as long as you like. You could quite easily lift a, a rear wheel going round corners. <laughs> I was only picked up for speeding twice, but I should have been picked up hundreds of times. I was constantly driving above the speed, because I was in a hurry. I was going somewhere. Occasionally, I had to go to head office to have meetings. And there so happened there was rather a pretty young lady who was the office manager in Gravesend. All right. Little did Tom know that this was a woman who was going to change his life forever. Captain Sir Tom is returning to normal, but he'll never get used to the fortune he raised for NHS charities. It's an enormous sum of money, isn't it? Can you imagine 40 million or whatever is in a big pile, what it would look like? <laughs> it doesn't come to me, unfortunately. He seems to personify virtues that we think we've lost. With his wartime background and with his longevity and as a family man and all the rest of it, he became the kind of perfect avatar of what we would like to think that Britain could be. Always have porridge for breakfast, always. Without change. <laughs> He's like a sort of a secular version of the Queen. We were in this time of great crisis and anxiety and people looked to him and they said you know there's a kind of Britishness that reminds us that we will prevail and we'll come through this. He knows it's licking time. Tom Moore the building materials salesman would find it all very hard to believe. Throughout the 50s and 60s, he worked long and hard. If I had to do the extra mile, I did it. I just it was intent on, on making progress. Because he could see a bit more in your pocket. He specialised in a cheap and versatile material, concrete. I supplied the concrete block facing for the new flower market at Covent Garden. And I went out to help Barcelona Airport being built. Business was looking up, but back in Britain, a helping hand was needed. You've got a huge economic boom in Britain in the 50s and 60s, but you don't have enough labour. It's as simple as that. So there is a huge demand for unskilled, cheap labour. And the place that um, fulfils that demand is the Commonwealth. So the West Indies, um, India and Pakistan. And you have this huge influx, hundreds of thousands of people, um, and they, they go to areas where there's the work. So they go to London, um, they go to uh, the West Midlands, so the engineering and so on, and they go to places like West Yorkshire, to the mills. Tom was now a manager in Gravesend. Having 
Being to be Indian, I was used to Indian. I was the first person in the town to employ a Pakistani, and there was resistance amongst the other workers against him to begin with. Eventually, they accepted him as he was all right, but initially, there was resistance. I think that all immigrants into this country should be controlled. Half of them are coming over here without jobs. Consequently, we're making it very hard for our own people to find jobs. Britain was a society in which a lot of people had never seen uh, a non-white person. You know, they'd been raised with an unthinking sense of superiority and a whole set of attitudes that now would seem quite shocking. And so, I think particularly when the economy starts to stutter and people are looking for scapegoats, then the new immigrant population sort of becomes a target. The West Indians, they were super workers. They worked and they worked and they worked. They all worked hard. If, if we, the colored people, can meet English people on their own level, in discussion, in relationship, I think the harmony will be better. Personally, I think so. The cultural revolution that Tom witnessed in 60s Britain took many forms. Well, she loves you. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. The youngsters were having a swing time. Anything happened, anything went. Sex and miniskirts all seemed to go together. So the common view of the 60s is, is that this is this age of tremendous change. It's Carnaby Street, it's James Bond and the Beatles and all the rest of it. And there is an element of truth in that. But of course, for most people, the 60s didn't really swing at all. I mean, free love was OK, fine. Did you manage to partake in free love in the 60s? No, no, I was far too busy. <laughs> The 60s was an era for most people of kind of bingo, Blackpool and Bernie Inns. You know, did the 60s arrive in Hull? They did in 1987. By 1968, 48-year-old Tom was a successful businessman working in London. But there was still something missing. His mind went back to Pamela the office manager he'd once encountered. I thought, that's a good idea, that one. And I got more and more attached to this young lady in the, in the office management. The relationship blossomed, and eventually I married her. No going down on one knee or anything fancy like that. She was 15 years younger than me. Her family generally weren't very happy about it. You don't have Yorkshiremen in here in Southern again. They're animals, they're, they, don't, they don't speak proper, so... <laughs> but because I'm very well, maybe she thought anything's better than nothing. <laughs> in short order, Tom and Pamela started a family. We just got married in time. Close enough people hadn't done the sums properly, so then worked it out. Otherwise... There were some who disapproved. But what did I care? <laughs> Nothing. A year later, man was on the moon. The spirit of exploration pervaded Britain's and Tom's family life. For our summer holiday, he would go into planning weeks before. We drove to Italy and we drove to France and we drove to Spain. So real early memories, right, of being exposed to other languages and, and other cultures. It was high adventure, always. They were both on their torso, do practical things, changing light bulbs, hammers and nails, as I was. No, they were brought up to be practical, and they are, both of them. We learnt to drive forklifts. Navigation was his absolute thing. So I've been brought up with navigation and maps, always trying to give us skills. It was all part of a plan. Realising he was much older than the average dad, 
Tom was equipping his daughters for the future. His goal was, by the time we were 15 or 16, that if he wasn't around, we were ready to take on the world. And I think it, it worked, because I did feel like that. Meanwhile, Tom was making more strides in the business world. In 1983, now working for a Cambridge concrete company, he led a management buyout, raising the equivalent of £1 million in today's money and saving jobs at one of the area's biggest employers. He saved it. Extraordinary. I remember him um, with all the spreadsheets on the table. And they were laid out end to end whilst he was working it all out. Within a few years, the company had been revitalized and Tom sold out just before the financial crash of 1987. And came out of there quite well off. Tom, now 67, and his wife Pamela moved to the Costa del Sol, part of a mass migration to Spain by Brits seeking warmer weather. He was looking forward to a tranquil retirement with the girl of his dreams, but it was not to be. Pamela fell seriously ill, and they had to return home. Pamela are showing signs of not being very well mentally. It was a degenerative brain disorder. Some of her behavior changed. It was very obvious that she was deteriorating. You know, within a year she was in hospital um, because he couldn't cope with her at home. She really had deteriorated very badly. Totally tragic. It was a real moment in life to have that moment with your father, to realize that his wife, my mother, was never going to come back. He visited her every day for five years in, that, in, in where she was. Every single day he went without fail to see her. I had a contract, hadn't I? In, 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 in a sickness in health, I saw the contract. It's the most horrific thing to watch. And you go through loss every day because you know every day they're going away a little bit further. When she actually died, it was a happy release for all of us. I mean, I didn't spend years you know, mourning about it because the person I married had gone a long time before. What can you do? You either you either become a victim or you or you charge forward and and that's what we did. He he just got on with it. You just got to get on with it and do it and, and see what happens. And Tom's next chapter was perhaps the most extraordinary, but also one where he nearly died. Did I think he would survive it in all honesty? And no, I don't think we did. Another day, another virtual award ceremony. All right, we're all set. I'm Hannah, by the way. Oh, now I can't hear her. After his wife Pamela died in 2006, Tom moved in with his daughter Hannah and her family. He stayed very active, holidaying alone into his 90s, first by visiting India and then Nepal. It's a marvellous country, looking over on the Himalayas. As you marched, the world watched. I had a, a, a flight in a fairly small plane and circled Mount Everest. You know, little peak amongst hundreds of other peaks. So all your new friends in the Guild of Freeman. I don't know whether it broadens your minds or not, but it doesn't do you any harm. Captain Sir Tom. Captain Sir Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. I don't think he's ever retired, has he, really? Let's be really honest. I think that life never stopped turning for him. We've got six acres here, and up until really recently, he by himself mowed it. He's also been a very good cook. You know, he's the one that would get on and, and, and cook the Sunday lunch. 
great Yorkshire pudding. All from his grandmother's cookbook that is 119 years old, listing everything from sheep's tongue to lamb's brain in its ingredients. The only thing that you didn't use of a pig was its squeak. But the active lifestyle came to an abrupt halt 18 months ago. Throughout his charity walk, Tom hid the fact that movement is painful, the result of a near-fatal accident. I was in the kitchen, doing no harm to anybody. I was um, unloading the dishwasher. Um, and somehow I got tangled up with my own feet, and I fell down and hit my head against the dishwasher. But I fell on this hip and fractured this hip, and that was really what the, where the trouble started. So I was in, in hospital for quite some time. Tom had broken ribs and punctured a lung. He couldn't breathe properly. The family prepared for the worst. For a good few days, it was it was really touch and go, really touch and go. Did I think he would survive it in all honesty? No, I don't think we did. It was very painful, yes, but I survived and came out all right. By way of rehab, Tom bought himself a treadmill. I bought that, yes. I didn't tell them what I was doing, I just went and got him. I don't walk about easily. It's still quite a problem. But maybe one day he will go better. And things got a little better sooner than Tom thought. When the vintage motorcycle community heard Tom's lifelong passion was for motorbikes, they arranged a bike show in his back garden with examples of his favorite machines. And the best part, it was all a complete surprise. Tom was reunited with his darling bikes for the first time in 50 years. Magnificent. You say I'm a motorcycle fanatic. Still a beautiful bike. When you see the photographs of him on a motorcycle, he looked really happy. Maybe he couldn't have any water. In no way he could get some water. You're a isn't it? Yes, it's a great bike. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, because you've got that magnificent trio, really have. I'm absolutely thrilled to see these. And each one's only special in its way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Great honour. And it didn't stop there. World champion Dougie Lampkin, born in the next village to Tom and a winner of the Billy Moore Cup, dedicated to Tom's beloved uncle, gave him his own personal display. Morning, sir. He's showing off now. Have you ever seen him on television? He do go up things which are impossible. You don't realise how skillful it is till you try and do it. Beautiful. It sounds like it's running on one cylinder. There was one more contraption, even older than Tom. What's next, then? This was the 100-year-old biker's chance to go for just one more ride. That's another nice bike. One funny way you can think of him is as a time traveller. I bought that in Burma. Really? Yeah. Wow. About 1943. He's come further than almost all of us. Somebody who's lived so long, what they often have that so many of us don't have is a sense of perspective. Are we ready? It's a lovely thing. It really is a lovely thing. You know, they've seen the wheel of fortune turn. Reputations rise and fall. Fads come and go. And I think as, as time goes on, you become a little bit more seasoned, less dry, less hysterical. Are we going a bit fast for you, are we? A bit fast for me. Yes. <laughs> you know, that's, I think, what the experience of years gives you. <laughs> In 1925, when I was five, 
I could never imagine things that are happening now. That was absolutely wonderful. I never thought I'd be taking you for a ride out no. on a motorbike. I, I never thought you'd be taking me for a ride out. <laughs> We've got so many uh, down people who think, oh, it's terrible, but it isn't. Things are going to get better. <laughs> they are, really are. So what is Captain Sir Tom going to do next? Well, he's writing his memoirs, taking it very seriously. And then he wants to fix his hip so that he can get back on the mower. It's been a very interesting 12 weeks, and the very, today's been a, 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 an ex exceptionally good day. I mean, it really has. And is there any sign he'll now put his feet up? Of course not. <laughs>